Yeah. Hello. Um, welcome to the latest of the Slade Contemporary Art uh, Lecture uh, Series. This one, um, the aim of the series as it's set up is really to try and bring, bring different voices in. This one is more art historical in actual fact. Um, um, I'm very pleased to be able to invite um, Sophie Rakes, um, who's the assistant curator at the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. Uh, Sophie has um, authored and co-authored books on um, Oversby Park and on the work of Philip Barlow, uh, bad copies, and these are fair for her. She's curated many exhibitions, including recently Dennis Oppenheim, uh, Thought Collection Factories, and Stephen Cripps, uh, pyrotechnic, pyrotechnic Sculptor. Um, Sophie and I are working together um, on what will be the first exhibition of sculpture from the modern period in Japan ever to be shown in the UK. Um, Sophie will describe the exhibition, but as it's an exhibition that, um, or a project that I, I instigated a while ago, although Sophie and I are collaborating on it, uh, Sophie has asked me to uh, make an introduction to the project. And um, so I want to do that, so that the aim will be that Hopefully, I'll do a brief in introduction, maybe about 10, 15 minutes, um, then hand over to Sophie, and then at the end of the session, uh, we can take some questions from the floor. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, the exhibition itself will um, focus on certain key works from the uh, Taisho period, 1912, to the beginning of uh, this be Taisho I, to uh, Showa II, which is 1937, which is the period when the main concepts of Japanese sculpture were actually um, put in place. Um, this work here, which Sophie will be talking about, is called uh, About the Stone by um, Heihachi Hashimoto. Um, I want to go through um, some, most of the time we'll be using um, Western dating systems, but we will occasionally probably refer to Japanese period um, names. So I want to try and make, clarify that. So the Edo period, which is the shogunate period, um, um, will be referred to. Meiji is the point where the shogunate system collapsed and the emperor system started. Taisho, most of the other periods in the emperor system are based on the names of Japanese emperors or their titles. Um, Taisho, 1912 to 1926. Showa, 1920 to 1989. And we're now currently in the Heisei period. Um, it started in eight, 1989. We're now in Heisei 25. This is... Um, Prior to the uh, Meiji um, Restoration, this is Nagasaki, uh, which obviously was um, blown up by an atomic bomb. But um, the Togawa shogunate uh, quite sensibly decided to keep all foreigners out of Japan. And the island in the foreground called Deshima, the fan-shaped island, is where all foreigners, Chinese and Dutch, were kept. They, I think quite sensibly the Togawa shogunate realized that if they allowed Christians into the country, they would be invaded. Sounds a bit cruel, but in fact, if you look at it historically, that's almost what happens. Hmm? Then, um, the, the black ships arrived. Um, of Commander Perry. And forced uh, Japan to open up to the west. Um, this forced uh, Japan to modernize. It's very important to realize that uh, modernization, even though Japan had to modernize, and this applies to all countries that suffer from colonial invasions, also had to retain their own identity. Hmm? Uh, so Japan had to modernize, but had to remain Japanese at the same time. This led to uh, a movement, largely literary, 
called Nihon Jin, Jinron, or Japanese uniqueness. Prior to the arrival of the black ships, the collapse of the uh, Edo uh, Togawa shogunate, um, and the instigation of the um, emperor system under Emperor Meiji, there was knowledge of Western painting through uh, the Dutch. And the Togawa shogunate did allow um, the study of Banjin, or barbarian studies. Hmm? So, um, Western style painting in Japan is known as yoga. And Japanese style uh, painting uh, is known as Nihonga. However, there was no real knowledge of, um, of sculpture in Japan, hmm? in the Western sense. Um, I don't mind it, mind it. Oh yes, we'll go on to this in a minute. So, um, and there's no actual reason why there should be, because sculpture in that form is actually a Western concept and there's nothing to do with um, any other cultures than our own, really. There were bushi, or um, uh, Buddhist image makers, um, but the concept of individual sculptors or sculpture as discrete objects did not exist. There was no word for fine art in Japan. Um, this is now um, translated as bijutsu um, and was introduced in the late 1890s, mainly to try and deal with um, the word aesthetic, which was coming actually through Hegel in Germany. Um, so the Meiji government um, needed to modernize rapidly, yet remain Japanese, and it founded the first Japanese art school, and this is it here. Hmm? It's uh, called the Kobu Bijutsu Jako, and it was founded in 1876. The Slade was opened in 1871, so there's a very interesting confluence of the dates of these two, I think, very, very modern art schools at that time. Um, so, if I go on to two more terms. Similarly, there was no word for sculpture. And um, so, Chokoku was coined in 1894, as you can see here. Chozo, or modeling, coined in 1914. They, uh, and these are, this is technically called a clack, which is where um, Chinese characters or Sino characters, uh, which in Japanese are called kanji, are brought together to make a new word. Hmm? The, um, the uh, first um, kanji on this side essentially means carving. And to my crude understanding, because I don't speak Japanese, um, is that um, the top character in Chokoku uh, means carving and graving. And the second character on the bottom means carving modeling. Hmm? Um, so, this is carving, I think. This is Jayo Kusama uh, by Araki, and I think she's carving. And then there's modeling. Um, this is Asakura Fumio. Um, and this is where I try to, uh, in the background of this image, you'll see the figure with the arms like this. But I have a, quite a long history of working with things Japanese, but I first went to Japan in 1984 for a large group exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in Tokyo and did see lots of um, Japanese sculpture, but like a lot of people, this is the problem with Japanism. It didn't look very Japanese to me, so I was very blind to it. Then much later, um, this is, I was uh, traveling through Ueno uh, Station, and I saw this sculpture, which is the one in the previous slide. Uh, I've got to pronounce this badly, it's called Suba, or Wings. And I looked at it and thought, you know, this is, Although it's subseemingly Rodanesque, it's actually a very good sculpture. And hence, um, I started to think that um, 
how extraordinary it was that no Japanese sculpture had been shown in the UK or hardly outside of Japan. None of the work since 1868 had actually been seen outside of Japan. And um, being enthusiastic and stupid at the same time, I decided to do something about it, and hence, I started a project called Nihon Kindai Chokoku. And um, over six years ago, with uh, Dr. Hana Sakuma and other friends, I needed help. Uh, but in my mind, there's only one place to start to actually work on this, and this was the Henry Moore Institute in Leeds. This Henry Moore Institute in Leeds for the study of sculpture is perhaps the leading center of uh, study of sculpture worldwide. So I went to um, the Henry Moore um, Center, the Institute, and um, asked them to work with me on the project. And hence, we're working with it. <laughs> My last slide. So we started going around um, the various collections in Japan. This is a, a shot of uh, my associate in Japan, Yuko Sugoyara, who's a sculptor from the Slade, who now works at Mushoshino Arts University. And we're now collaborating with Mushoshino Arts University in Tokyo on an exhibition that will be at the Henry Moore Institute and also at the Art Museum in Mushoshino. So that's my intro over. I'd like to hand you over to Sophie. Oh, thank you, Ed. <coughs> Just want to change the slides over. The right. Great. Um, I am going to talk to you about the um, small exhibition of. Um, of Japanese sculpture, which we are organising at the um, Henry Moore Institute, shown on the left, um, in partnership with Art School in Tokyo, as Ed said, and with the Slade. Um, the um, show is going to be staged in um, Gallery 4 at the Institute from January to April 2015, and will travel in a slightly expanded form, I think, to Tokyo in late spring summer 2015. The exhibition it, um, is going to show a few carefully s s selected pieces of, of, the, the, of the modern Japanese sculpture, drawing upon major museum collections in Japan, um, including, for instance, the Museum of m m m m m Modern Art in Tokyo and the um, Tokyo School of Fine Arts, and bring, this, bring pieces of this period to, um, to UK audiences for the, for the first time, which is something that we're really very excited to be able to do. Um, given the current lack of knowledge in Britain, um, and in the West generally, I think, of Japanese sculpture of this period, we kind of think of the exhibition as an object-based kind of research project, which is going to help to bring a consideration of, of Japanese sculpture into the field of adult of, of Anglophone sculpture studies, and, and, the spirit of that, and in that spirit, I'd like to say now that, um, that um, some of the thoughts on the exhibition that I will present here are kind of speculative and are very much open to discussion, and perhaps at the end, we can sort of start that discussion here. Um, in any case, the, the um, exhibition is going to be the focus for, a, for a, a series of study events at the Institute and in Tokyo and at the Slade, which will bring together scholars from, from, J from Japan and from Britain and we hope will promote international discussion around a subject which itself, as Ed says, kind of embodies a kind of cross-cultural exchange. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the sort of genesis of the project. Ed's mentioned um, a bit himself, but um, uh, I think Ed first came to us at the Institute in around 2009, so, so, so kind of several years ago. Um, I think um, that long gestation period for the project can be attributed to kind of several factors. Well, um, on a practical level, we've discovered that bringing objects from Japan to Britain is an extremely expensive exercise. And we've, to, 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 to kind of mitigate that, we've had to spend kind of quite a long time building up partnerships, kind of sharing the exhibition, and also going um, to, to um, 
several external grant giving organizations for external funds. But um, this isn't, I think, the real reason that, that it's taken so long. I think it's because it's the um, subject um, is just, was, um, just so new to us when, when, when um, Ed kind of first talked about it. It took us a really long time, I think, to kind of get our heads around, you know, the, the kind of meaning of it and the kind of context for it. it took a, I think that took a great deal of thought and several trips to, trips to Japan since, since then. Um, uh, um, in his first presentation, um, Ed showed us kind of life-size bronze figure sculpture from the late 19th and early 20th centuries, amongst other objects, but these, I think, dominated. And I think, at the first glance, these do look very similar to kind of, to kind of pieces that were being made in Britain, or well, in, not in, uh, in Britain, but more widely in Europe uh, during the same period um, by us, including Rodin and Bordel. And I think we, did, we just couldn't understand really what we were looking at at, at that time. Um, but I'm then kind of Ed explained to us that these objects kind of were a kind of visual manifestation of a decisive break in Japanese history, which was marked by the restoration of the Meiji, of, um, of the Meiji Emperor in 1868. And that prior to 1868, on um, 68, there was no established kind of concept of sculpture in Japan. Um, and no monumental figure or portrait sculpture, no art scores, and, uh, I mean, no value placed in kind of in the idea of realism um, in, um, in art in a kind of Western sense. And um, initially, this, this was quite sort of mind blowing, I think. It took a lot to to kind of accommodate, but um, then um, kind of, I think Ed, um, Ed also pointed out that the, re that the key term here was really um, in a Western sense, and, um, and um, because of course, although there was no kind of word for sculpture, there was a panoply of sort of object making practices, including temple sculpture and craft practices, including um, those kind of temple sculpture, for example, which included kind of human and, and animal forms, and also a, a range of craft practices which were developed especially in the Edo period and the kind of preceding, the period that precedes the Meido period in response to a kind of grow, a growing urban culture. And these included sort of masks, dolls, netsu, uh, um, oh, netsuke, um, swords, and, um, and other objects, and also perhaps the, the, the slightly more disreputable Iki Ningyo, which are life-size dolls, which were displayed in kind of theatrical tableau in, um, in urban fairs in the kind of mid and um, the kind of late, um, in, the, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Um, and, and, and although there, there may not have been a value placed on realism, I think we had to ask ourselves what we really meant by that term. Um, these, Japan, these Japanese objects are clearly very, um, extremely sort of realistic um, and kind of show a lot more detail in terms of color and sort of bodily bits than would have been acceptable in the West in the, um, in the same period. Um, the thing that Japanese didn't have, I suppose, is sort of, is, um, is a Western concept of, of realism, which was based kind of specifically on, the, on a tradition of um, kind of scientific anatomical study and of modeling from life using clay, which was established kind of after the, um, from the kind of 16th century onwards, I guess. Um, but in summary, I think the, um, the, the project that Ed brought us forced us to really kind of confront our own preconceptions and to question the kind of, I mean, to question the definitions of sculpture that we had in our mind and the kind of idea of, of the things that, that sculpture is and can be. Um, <clears throat> in, um, oh, sorry. Um, and in looking at Japanese sculpture of the post-Meiji period, which was made during a period of kind of, ma of rapid kind of modernization and westernization in Japan, we were keen as far as possible to kind of set aside the idea of 
the um, terms Western and modern, and to really kind of look at the objects afresh and to kind of try to think and, and therefore try to kind of understand where they're coming from and the things that they're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> so this, um, this kind of brings me back to the next point, I guess. Uh, uh, um, that's that, um, that um, Ed very quickly told us that, 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 um, that this area of Japanese sculpture is a very new subject in terms of study, that in Japan, scholars have only really just started to kind of look at it again. Um, and the West is, um, is not come to the attentions of, of scholars at all. Um, the the um, first short text in English, which was translated from Japanese um, on this subject um, by the scholar, the, um, the um, Japanese scholar Shuji Tanaka, was um, published in 2012. And that's really all there is in English at, um, um, at this time. Um, the, um, this was a really exciting thing, but also incredibly daunting. Um, with um, no kind of readily available text to draw upon, we really had to use our eyes. Um, and I think that, that um, this is a great way to come into an exhibition, but you're also very open to error, I think. And, and the, um, the kind of choice of works that we've made for the show is very much based on the, um, on the objects that we saw when Ed and I traveled to Japan and the conversations that we had whilst we were there. Um, and Japanese colleagues kind of often were surprised or even bemused by the choices that we made. But, but they were always interested and very generously, they were just very keen to kind of get um, our thoughts as Western curators, scholars and artists on Japanese works of this period. And they kind of feel that um, this is the basis for a discussion which can start to put these, the, this sculpture within a broader context of our history. And that's something that we're really keen to do. Um, so, uh, so to return to our exhibition, um, oh yeah. um, right. So Ed has said that this small show is part of a kind of, of his kind of much broader research project, which looks at sculpture made in Japan after the Meiji period up to the end of Showa period, so from around 1868 to 1986. Just to give you, I think Ed has done it already, but I'll give you some very sketchy background history on this. Um, the, the, um, uh, the, um, the, the Meiji restoration of 1868 marks the moment when Japan was, was kind of opened officially, I suppose, to West influence for the first time in two centuries. The following decades, um, it, it, it seems to me, so, uh, saw the collision and fusion of two very different, different artistic cultures as foreign artists were invited to, um, into Japan, Japanese artists traveled to the West. The, the first Western style, uh, style art, um, art, art academies were founded in Tokyo and the Western concept of art as opposed to craft was established. Um, in the Meiji period, which is 1868 to 1912, Japanese sculpt um, sculptors were the background in, in, uh, traditional Japan um, in traditional object making, were, were kind of experimenting with Western sculptural techniques, um, including modeling in clay, working d d directly from a life model, um, um, anatomical realism, including dissection, portraiture and figure sculpture. But the exhibition isn't actually going to focus on the Meiji period. It's going to look instead um, at the succeeding, the, the kind of following Taisho and early Showa period, which is from around 1912 to 1946. In these periods, a younger generation of sculptors born in the Meiji context, but, but for whom Western sculpture was an established part of the canon, were able to, to um, draw upon a wide variety of different sources, which included Western sculpture, but, but also non-Western forms, and going back to traditional, um, to, to, to traditional craft forms as well. Um, the exhibition is going to show the work of five sculptors, including three master sculptures, which is Takamuro Katoro, um, Um, Sato Chozan and um, Hajimoto um, Hihachi, excuse me, um, and two pupils of master, of master sculptures, uh, um, including Miyamoto Rizaburo and Mitsunoya Tetsuya. Um, this is not an established grouping of artists, because as I was saying before, the, 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 the kind of choice of works was really visual rather than historical. 
Um, but, but, but all of them, apart from Kataro, were, 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 were um, involved and showed their work in the Intern exhibitions, a series of independent artist-led exhibitions, which were established in 1912 in Tokyo, and kind of set up it, um, in opposition to the government-sponsored um, Bunten exhibitions. Kataro, as a senior artist in terms of status, was separate but supportive of the Inten group. The, 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 the um, personal histories of, this, of these artists s s suggest a really complex kind of web of influences. Kataro, first of all, was the um, son of a Buddhist car um, carver, Takamimura Kawun, um, who was credited with preserving tr with, um, traditional carving techniques during the Meiji period. Kotaro studied in Tokyo, New York, London, and Paris, and translated texts by Rodai into Japanese. He, he, he was a really famous poet as well as a sculptor, and his kind of his his um his his textual output made him an important artistic spokesman for his generation. He published his own artistic tre treatise, Green Sun, in 19, I mean 19, in 1910. Um, then Chozan came from a family of of kind of of, um, of temple carvers. He studied in Tokyo in his late teens and 20s, um, but was then sponsored by the government to um, travel to Paris in 1922, and he was there based in the studio of Bordel. Um, curiously, after he came back from Paris, he started to make sculptures of animals, birds, and vegetables, in addition to the Western-style figure sculpture, which he'd been um, previously been known for. And um, I actually studied under Sato Chozan in Tokyo. In the mid-20s, he lived with, with, with his brother, Kitazono Katsue. He was one of the most important Japanese avant-garde poets of the 20th century, influenced by surrealism, futurism, and Dadaism. He, he, well, well, he, um, he, he, he um, later studied um, ancient Buddhist sculpture from the 8th century in Nara and... and became deeply impressed with the carvings of um, the monk Enku um, from a later period. He also published his own art treatise, A, a Theory of Pure Sculpture, which was, pub which was published posthumously by his brother in 1942. Then Riza Bureau was a pupil of Chozan and worked for him in the 20s and 30s, when Chozan was focusing on making small sculptures of animals and birds. And finally, Tetsuya Mitsunoya was apprenticed to Toen Morikawa, he was a kind of painter and sculptor based in Nara in the late Edo period who worked principally for a shrine, for a shrine and whose polychrome carving of deer was um, chosen for, for, for the um, international exhibition in Chicago in 1892. I think the is in a slightly different category from the other artists in, in the selection because he's a bit older and came from, from a more traditional background in terms of education. But nevertheless, like all the other artists represented here, he worked in both Western clay and more traditional timber and made Western-style figures, figure sculptures and portraits as well as, well, well, as more craft-based objects. Um, <clears throat> the, um, although, as Ed sort of, I think has said, the kind of major innovation in the Meiji period was kind of Western-style figure sculpture, the, the, the exhibition isn't going to focus principally on this area, although, as you can see from the images here, although actually the ha it is very much represented by the sculpture of the hand. The, um, instead, the, the, um, the um, choice of work um, by these five artists focuses on sculptural representations of nature, including polychrome carvings of dried fish, um, birds, a crustacean or shrimp, and a, um, and a cabbage, on a stone that's carved in, carved in um, timber, and, uh, um, and a hand that's, that's been kind of sculpted in clay, then cast in bronze, and is supported on a carved wood base, which kind of extends up into the kind of core of the, of the, the, the of the, the, the um, kind of, the, of the, 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 the um, wrist of the hand. Um, I think we, we, we um, chose pieces for the exhibition very purposely, which are kind of ambiguous objects. They, um, and they seem to us to kind of draw upon both Western and Japanese traditions, but not to sit very easily inside either context. 
and they did, uh, and they've got a, a distinctive character of their own, which I think still feels really fresh today when you look at them. Um, <clears throat> All of these objects do accommodate kind of Western concepts of, of, of sculpture. Um, it's important to note that they are very consciously all carved directly from life with the object, which is the subject being kind of, you know, just in front of the artist. But they also pose really interesting questions for kind of Western sculpture in terms of their subject matter, scale, support, color, and the approach to materials. But I'll just say a little bit more about each of these concerns um, now. I mean, in terms of subject matter, the, the exhibition focuses on nature study and still life. This is, is not an established category in Western sculpture, really, at all. It seems to belong to a specifically Japanese context in which the human body is not emphasized, as in the Western tradition. And sculptors were able to draw upon a plan panoply of natural forms, including animate and inanimate objects, humans, animals, and plants, and not making any kind of, any, um, um, kind of hierarchical distinctions between those forms. Um, and although all of the sculptors kind of shown here were, um, either, were unknown either principally or additionally um, for their kind of figure sculpture, there is some evidence, I think, that nature and still life sculpture provided them with a, with a distinctive space to experiment in. From instance, Sato Chozan and Kataro started to make nature study sculpture, including the birds and the um, toad, which you see in the top right corner, and a cabbage in the 20s and 30s, after they'd come back from intensive study in Europe. And, and um, uh, Kataro often um, mentioned, well, kind of used his nature study sculpture as a subject in his poetry, including kind of talking about the, the, the act of carving two of the works that, that, that he made, a cicada and a catfish. He describes the, the um, catfish splashing around in its tank and the cicada perched, de perched delicately on the edge of his desk as he carved. Um, in terms of scale, all of, the, all of the chosen objects are quite small, but they are life size or over in, um, in terms of the object that they represent. And so although I'm, I'm kind of normally think of small scale sculpture in terms of sort of miniaturization, these are objects that celebrate small things and fragments. Um, in, terms of, um, in terms of support and articulation, they're either carved or modeled in the round or the base is fully integrated in, um, into the work. So they, these objects kind of read as objects rather than as sculptures perhaps. Um, and many of the works need to be picked up um, and turned uh, to be fully appreciated. For, for, for instance, the um, red shrimp um, has got, is, is kind of very, is very fully carved on the underside. Um, oh, and the, um, and the catfish too, equally the same. And in fact, the, the, the um, hand sculpture, which is, which is in the middle there, um, that can be taken off the base to kind of show a sort of second carving because, it, because the base is kind of carved as a, almost as a kind of abstract sculpture and the signature of the artist is, is kind of um, inscribed on that. I haven't got an image of that, I'm afraid. Um, in terms of the materials, um, <clears throat> oh, I'm just, I'm just, I just want to say first that, that I think in subject matter scale and articulation, it's possible to link these objects to kind of some Edo period craft objects, including 18th and 19th century Natsuke, kimono toggles carved in ivory, um, which often incorporate natural forms and, um, and just kind of small and, and sort of, sort of and, um, and just small objects which are intended for display within, tokenom within the Antokonoma, which is a niche inside kind of Japanese home, and which um, kind of small objects, including flower arrangements and stones sometimes, were viewed and possibly handled in a kind of social context. Um, in terms of the materials, um, all of the works apart from, apart from hand um, are carved in timber and have got some kind of applied color. And that might be a light, subtle kind of, you know, just a, just, uh, just a, just a kind of, just, just, just 
just a light coating, or it might be kind of a dense, rich layer with undetailed surface effects, which is the case with the fish, and I suppose with the lobster, with the lobster as well. Um, it, it, I think in all of these objects, there's a, there's a kind of slippage between different materials and forms. So in, in the um, fruit, uh, fruit of the sea, um, the dried fish, these are both carved and coloured by the artist, and they kind of slip between categories of sculpture and painting. They're very flat things, although if you turn them over, they're kind of articulated on both sides. Um, and about the stone um, and hand, both kind of juxt um, juxtapose inert and organic um, materials. And so in, I mean, in the stone, that's a stone that's carved in timber, and in the hand, it's a bronze hand, which, is, which has got a timber base that goes right up into the, um, up inside it. Um, and I'll say a bit more about this later. Um, and finally, I was going to show you a piece of which, in fact, isn't going to be in the exhibition, unfortunately, but it's a pomegranate, also carved by Kataro. And although it's kind of carved, it, it, it actually, I think he purposefully incorporated some of, some of the looseness and softness which is associated with Western kind of um, sculpture in clay into this work. Um, <clears throat> I, was, I was looking in a little bit more detail at some of the individual pieces which we've chosen for the exhibition. And I've, I've included um, cabbage here, which unfortunately we were not able to borrow, but has been, but was really part of the selection from a very early stage. So I'm going to talk about it a bit here. The, um, the um, group of, of objects shown here kind of seem to be a very straightforward representations of natural subjects dried fish, birds, a lobster, and a cabbage, based, based, based upon close observation from life. But the subject matter is often quite nuanced. It's more nuanced than um, perhaps it first seems. Um, uh, for instance, the um, cabbage is a form that's traditionally used in Western art education as a test of skill in drawing. And here, Sato Chozan kind of has, has kind of, kind of um, kind of incorporated to, to um, demonstrate his virtuoso skill in carving, but it also used, you used it as a vehicle to kind of study Western sculptural values of mass and volume in terms of the form of the cabbage itself. The um, type of cabbage here, um, shown here, is, it, it is a Chinese cabbage, and that's a type which was introduced into Japan from Manchuria in the early 20th century. And so, in terms of subject, it's, it's kind of definitely foreign but also you know, very definitely not European, and so it's an interesting kind of thing going on there too. Um, and the, um, then finally, the um, shrimp it is, a common, um, is a common kind of form in, 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 in traditional Japanese craft practice. It was used um, quite extensively by, 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 the, um, by Mitsunoi's master, Toen Marakawa, who applied it to kind of small decorative ob objects and functional items which he made for the home, including kind of, um, well, a little bit, uh, the, 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 the piece on the left is a kind of, a, a little box and it kind of opens into with a line across the center of the work. Um, <clears throat> um, you, you, um, you can see the shrimp on the right is kind of, is non-functional and slightly more rounded and solid than the one on the left, perhaps showing an accommodation of, of kind of Western sculptural values, but it's also very closely linked to craft practice and kind of you know, marks the latter as, as a really important thread it, um, that runs through Japanese sculpture in the post-Meiji period. The, um, I think the key works in the exhibition are um, about the stone, which is shown here, and the hands, and I'm going to talk about the, the, the um, stone um, first. Um, the, um, the, uh, about the stone is a portrait of a stone made in timber, and the um, shown on the um, kind of stone, which is the basis of the carving, is normally exhibited alongside alongside the sculpture. Um, the um, carved stone is placed on a plinth, a bit like kind of one of Constantin Brancusi's sculptures, in which the base becomes a sculpture um, in itself, or, or indeed like a Japanese kind of, I'm a Japanese Suzuki, uh, um, Suzuki, I think, or a um, can you say that word, Ed? Yes, oh, thank you, yes. 
or, um, or a kind of stone in a traditional tokonoma display. Um, Suzuki are considered as microcosms of nature, kind of small worlds, um, kind of, you know, kind of small encapsulating kind of um, objects. And in choosing um, this, the, the um, stone as a subject, the, the, the artist here kind of endorses that view of nature, which embraces the whole of the kind of whole of um, of the the, 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 the kind of whole of whole of nature, including animate and, um, and inanimate objects, um, as equally imbued with, with life and spirit. About the stone is an, um, is an inert object carving carved in in kind of organic timber, which has which has got kind of distinctive super, supernatural associations. It, it's significant that that the artist carved the stone from um, from, uh, from heart from from kind of the heart of the timber, the, the um, central living part of the tree, which sculptors would would, would normally avoid because it's very sappy and unstable. And the, and the stone itself, um, both in the it, um, in its kind of natural state and in the carving, is is kind of extremely heart-shaped. Um, um, the, 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 the artist here, um, um, in the approach to materials, I mean, the approach to materials echoes that of the, of the Buddhist kind of um, of the Buddhist carver Enku, whose carvings he studied in Nara. Um, Enku made figure sculptures from from single from sing, from, 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 from single trees, um, and in doing so, tried to harness the um, spirits and magical powers which he felt to be embedded deep inside forests. Um, <clears throat> then there's, there's another interesting thing to consider is, is in the same year that, that the artist carved this stone, his poet brother Katsui published his manifesto of Japanese um, Japanese um, sorry. Um, and there's no concrete evidence that Katsui's kind of text directly influenced his brother's sculpture, though we know the brothers were close and exchanged ideas. But it's really interesting that Katsui's version of surrealism emphasizes the, the um, juxtaposition of incongruous ideas and images, and that he too found possibilities in the idea of e exchanging one medium for another, um, describing how poets allowed him to paint with words. So it may be possible in the future to find parallels between their very different practices. The final piece in the exhibition, um, and this is just a, a, Suzuki, um, a Suzuki as an example. <laughs> The, uh, the final piece in the exhibition, Kataro's Hand, does not immediately present itself as a nature study sculpture, I guess. But in terms of its scale, it links um, to the other objects in the exhibition. And inside a kind of non-Western view of nature that, that incorporates the, the um, human body, um, uh, um, as opposed to kind of separate it and elevate it, the hand can be seen as a natural form. Uh, I think the, the kind of one of the many interesting things about hand is that Katara used it to kind of set, set up a series of dualities. Firstly, it's clear that the idea of the fragmented hand comes from the work of, 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 of um, August who was one of Katara's mentors when, when, he, when, he, when he was studying in Paris. But, but, but it's also displayed in the mudra position, which is a common ge um, gesture in Japanese Buddhist statuary. Um, secondly, the, the, the hand is very much kind of made in a kind of, um, with kind of Western style. Realism, with kind of every vein and sin, sin, um, sinew showing, and was obviously based on direct observation from life. But the arrangement of the fingers is unnatural, and it is very difficult to um, achieve that, that gesture if you try to kind of form it with your own hand. Thirdly, though, um, the hand is kind of made in clay and cast in bronze, the base which rises into the wrist of the hand, it's carved loosely in timber, and it's tempting to read the organic, living, 
living timber and is breathing life into the inert bronze hand, which twists and extends upwards, seeming to grow out of the base a bit like a tree. Um, in his text, Kataru described nature as a life force or, or essence. In these terms, these two works by Kataru in the exhibition deal with the, con with the concept of nature in different and complementary kind of manners, and that's the, the um, hand and the paddy birds. The paddy birds are part of a series of nature study carvings which Kataru made in the 20s alongside his more widely known figurative work, including catfish, cicada, pomegranates, uh, pomegranates and peaches. He describes the, the process of carving some of, some of these objects in his poems as bringing him closer to nature or to the creative life force inside himself. Conversely, hand can be seen as a representation of the life force itself. I think that's where, that's where it finishes. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.